Hey everyone, welcome to a special installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today we're going to be going back and taking a look at 60 Harry Potter plot holes discussed on the channel over the last few years. I've cut some out for an even 60, so please be aware of some inconsistent numbering. Also, I've tried my best to level out the audio across the videos, but in some instances there is a bit of variation. Without further ado, let's dive in. Number 1. The Pensive by Colton Smith At the end of the fourth book, why didn't Harry put his memory of Voldemort's return in the Pensive, then show it to Fudge and other Ministry people? That would have solved almost all of the problems of the fifth book. With 1800 thumbs up, this plot hole theory got a lot of support from many other fans, and for good reason. I mean, why didn't Harry do this? He could have easily proven his innocence to Fudge, while simultaneously proving that Voldemort was back. A few of you responded to this comment with a possible answer to the plot hole. That is, since memories can be altered, Fudge may have accused Harry of simply changing the memory to match with his story. However, this is quite a difficult bit of magic, and as we know, Harry wasn't actually the strongest when it came to these types of spells, at least not at this stage in the series. Remember, at this point, he hadn't even begun his occlumency lessons with Professor Snape, in which he does not immediately excel. A few other fans mentioned that perhaps Fudge may have then accused Dumbledore of altering Harry's memory, since Fudge had already concluded that Harry and Dumbledore were colluding. While that may be true, I still think this is an excellent plot hole theory that's worthy of some debate. 2. Petunia's Magical Knowledge by Some Other Dude It states early in book 2 that all of the Dursleys didn't know Harry wasn't allowed to use magic outside of school because he was underage, at least until the letters started coming in that told them. How did Petunia not know that underage wizards and witches weren't allowed to use magic outside of school when she grew up around Lily? I love this plot hole theory, and to be completely honest, it's not one I'd ever thought about, but of course, Petunia should have known this. A few other fans responded to this comment with the idea that perhaps Petunia had such a denial complex about Lily's magic that she blocked out everything to do with the wizarding world. But you'd think that when it was right under her nose, taking place in her very own home, something would have resonated and brought back these suppressed memories from her childhood in relation to Lily. I mean, as a child, Petunia went so far as to send a letter to Dumbledore requesting that she be admitted to the magical school, despite her lack of being, well, a witch. That's to say that she was so aware of how the magical school of witchcraft and wizardry worked that she knew how to contact the headmaster. 3. The Chamber of Secrets by Petros Cosmos A part I always considered a major plot hole is that Harry discovered the entrance of the Chamber of Secrets but Dumbledore couldn't. Harry found out that Myrtle was the girl that died 50 years ago and asked her, how did you die? But Dumbledore was there 50 years ago and he knew that Myrtle was the girl who died. So why, when the chamber was opened again, didn't he immediately go to Myrtle and ask her everything about her death? It seems pretty strange that a wizard like Dumbledore couldn't figure this out. Of course, he wouldn't be able to open the chamber, but still, he would know where the entrance was. This is another great plot hole, in my opinion. Shouldn't Dumbledore have known to ask Myrtle? There's always the theory that he did know, or knew he could ask Myrtle, but was grooming Harry to one day go up against Voldemort. I personally would hate to think that this was true, but then again, it would make sense. Because the very idea that Dumbledore wouldn't have thought to inquire to Myrtle just doesn't match up. 4. Marauder's Map Mistake by Joe Jackson I noted another plot hole in the third book, when Lupin finds Sirius, Harry, Ron, and Hermione in the Shrieking Shack, he claims that he knew they were there because he saw them on the Marauder's map. Surely, if this was the case, he would have seen two versions of Harry and Hermione as they had gone back in time and were only 30-40 feet behind them. Surely Lupin would have been rather confused. This theory brings up an excellent point. The only reasoning I can think of that would explain it is that the Marauder's map does not seem to be a terribly honest magical item. For example, apparently an guy could only be seen on the map in their animal form if the viewer knew that that witch or wizard was an guy. In other words, it would lie to the viewer. This explains why only Lupin was able to see Peter Pettigrew on the map when he was in the form of Ron's pet, Scabbers. So, perhaps future selves were also not shown on the map. 
unless the viewer knew to look for them there. Number 5. The Problems with Sirius by Srinidhi Prakash Sirius alone creates a bunch of problems. 1. Beginning a Philosopher's Stone Dumbledore doesn't ask any questions when Hagrid says he borrowed Sirius' bike, despite Sirius being the one presumed to have betrayed the Potters. 2. Owls always found Sirius when he was on the run, so why couldn't the Ministry? 3. Why did no castle portraits see Sirius breaking in, tell the staff about how he got in and where he went? I really have nothing to say about these plot holes other than I think they're bloody brilliant and incredibly spot on. 6. The Hogwarts Express by Darren Thorpe Also, does the Hogwarts Express really only run from King's Cross to Hogsmeade non-stop? If we take Neville for instance, who is clearly from Yorkshire, in the films at least, that's roughly halfway between London and Scotland. Why does he have to go to London to get a train back up past Yorkshire and on to Hogwarts? And what about Cho Chang and Oliver Wood? Do they really have to go from Scotland to London and back to Scotland again? We definitely see Cho do this in the films. Why is everything so London centric? This is a fantastic logistical plot hole. Do the students who come from Northern UK all have to travel down to London to then travel back up north to Hogwarts Castle in Scotland? This seems completely illogical, especially for a world filled with magic. 7. Hagrid's Werewolf Cubs by Eden B. My favorite plot hole is in, I think, the second book, where someone says that Hagrid, when he was a student, raised werewolf cubs under his bed. So he literally had human babies living under his bed for all but one night a month where they transformed? Lol, WTF rolling. This is just hilarious. I view it less as a plot hole and more of just a giant oversight. But no matter how you view it, it is certainly a mistake. Clearly the intention here was for Hagrid to have kept magical creatures under his bed, not human babies. 8. Charlie's Wand by Robin J. 1939 The plot hole I always remember is that Ron's wand was actually Charlie's former wand. Wands are not items for people to pass down, like how a younger sibling may wear their older sibling's hand-me-downs. Charlie should still need his wand for various things, so giving it away just makes life harder for him. This is such an interesting plot hole to me. Because of course, I always assumed Ron got Charlie's old wand since the Weasley family didn't have all that much money to go around. But if Ron got Charlie's wand, Charlie would have needed a new wand. And as Robin J1939 says, wands are not meant to be passed down. In fact, they are known to rebel and not work properly for witches or wizards with whom it did not originally match with. So either Charlie was wandless, which we know wasn't the case, or a new wand was purchased for him. Why not keep the wand meant for him and get Ron his own? It's not like it would have been worn out like a pair of old shoes. Very odd indeed. 9. Snape's Potions Textbook by Montecito Why did Snape donate his old potions book to the school for it to be loaned out? He doesn't seem the generous type, especially with his own notes all throughout it. This plot hole theory made me laugh. No, Severus Snape does not seem like the generous type, does he? Some responses to this theory, however, mentioned that perhaps he had left it on purpose to help Harry progress through the class, and ultimately improve his magical abilities as he was getting nearer and nearer to facing Voldemort. After all, at one point in The Half-Blood Prince, he recognizes that Harry is using the textbook that once belonged to him and, not only does he not take it away, but he also doesn't punish Harry for cheating either. 10. Voldemort's Visit to the Ministry by Sav G one thing that always gets me is, in the fifth book, Voldemort spends the whole year luring Harry to the Department of Mysteries to get the prophecy because he doesn't want to risk coming to the Ministry himself for fear of exposure but yet turns up anyway when Harry is there and ends up revealing himself. This plot hole is so spot on. I really don't think there's any explanation that could solve this one, at least in my opinion. Why didn't Voldemort make his Death Eaters make the Unbreakable Vow? The Unbreakable Vow is a magical contract made between two parties that utilizes a binding spell. It's a dangerous and powerful spell that carries significant risks. Essentially, if either party breaks the term of the vow, they instantly die. And given how honest the spell keeps everyone, it's surprisingly underutilized in the Harry Potter series. And one use case in particular that often jumps to the forefront of fans' minds is, 
why didn't Voldemort use it on his Death Eaters? They were his followers, his henchmen. They can't think of a better way to keep your followers loyal than the imminent threat of death. There are a few possible explanations for this apparent plot hole, but I still think that the vow would have been a better course of action. The first possibility is that Voldemort valued fear over loyalty. Voldemort was known for instilling fear in his followers, rather than relying on their genuine loyalty. He may have believed that the threat of punishment or death was enough to keep his followers in line, and that the unbreakable vow was unnecessary. He also had an exceedingly large ego, which may have caused him to believe that no one would possibly cross him. He was also extremely powerful and perhaps overly confident in his magical abilities. He may have believed that he could control his followers using legitimacy or other similar means, and therefore felt no need to resort to the unbreakable vow. The unbreakable vow would have kept people like Snape from becoming double agents. Why did no one notice Peter Pettigrew on the Marauders map? One of the biggest plot holes in the Harry Potter franchise revolves around Ron's pet rat, Scabbers, who is later revealed to be Peter Pettigrew. Ron slept with Scabbers every night and carried him around, which should have been visible on the Marauders map possessed by Fred and George Weasley. However, the twins never mentioned to anyone that Ron was sleeping with a man named Peter. Some argue that Fred and George may not have noticed every name on the map, but given their mischievous nature and love for pranks, it seems likely that they would have checked on Ron's location enough times to spot his invisible friend Peter, making this particular revelation a glaring inconsistency in the story. Sure, Peter Pettigrew's name wouldn't have meant much to Fred and George, but the constant close proximity with their brother should have set off alarm bells. Why even have locks? In the Harry Potter story, our protagonists encounter door locks on a few occasions, and while this may seem like a rather innocuous detail to dive into, I can't help but think about how useless locks are in the magical world. The main reason for this being that the unlocking charm, Alohomora, is taught to first year Hogwarts students. If just about every witch and wizard walking around has the ability to unlock locks, it makes them seem very pointless. There also seem to be a variety of door unlocking slash general unlocking charms present in the wizarding world, which makes this doubly confusing. Colin Creevy is using muggle technology at Hogwarts. In the Goblet of Fire, it is established that muggle technology doesn't function at Hogwarts, preventing students from using phones or email to communicate with their parents. However, bearing that piece of information in mind, it seems puzzling that Colin Creevy's muggle camera appears to work just fine. It is possible that a professor enchanted the camera to make Colin feel more at home and allow him to capture his wizarding experiences, but I'm a bit skeptical. How did Fred and George get into the Marauders map? The Marauders map was originally created by James Potter, Sirius Black, Remus Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew during their time at Hogwarts. And since the map's creation, it has changed hands on a few occasions. When Fred and George Weasley began attending Hogwarts, they stole the map from Argus Filch, and after getting ample use of it, they passed it on to Harry Potter. While handing the map over, they inform him that the password to activate it is, I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. By tapping the map with a wand and reciting the password, the map reveals its secrets, including the layout of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, the location of every person within the castle, and secret passages that can be used to navigate the school grounds undetected. The issue here is how Fred and George would have figured out the map's password. As they stole the map from Vilch, presumably no one would have ever told them. As things stand, there's no identifiable explanation for how the pair would have revealed the map's secrets, or even why it would have stood out as an item of interest. The trace is inconsistent. After first stepping foot into the world of magic, Harry was repeatedly cautioned against using magic outside the premises of the school and before muggles. The wizarding world's concealment depended on this. The Ministry of Magic attempted to instill discipline in young witches and wizards by tracking any use of magic in their vicinity using a trace charm. However, throughout the series, this enforcement method was shown to be highly inconsistent. For instance, when Dobby or Harry performed magic at the Dursleys, the Ministry was quickly informed. In contrast, when members of the Order of the Phoenix used magic in the same location, 
there appeared to be no reaction from the trace. Ultimately, the trace charm proved highly ineffective, particularly as it wasn't able to properly identify the person responsible for casting the magic in the first place. Why didn't Harry contact Sirius instead of going to the Ministry? Throughout the Harry Potter series, Harry and his godfather Sirius communicate through a variety of covert means, but when Harry becomes concerned that Sirius is in danger, he fails to employ any of them. In the Order of the Phoenix, Harry encounters a vision of Sirius being held captive at the Ministry, and fearing his friend is in danger, he recklessly rushes to his aid. As a result, Harry falls into the clutches of the Death Eaters, and Sirius ultimately loses his life. However, I feel like this entire tragedy could have been prevented if Harry had simply used an alternative and already established method of communication. You see, earlier in the series, Sirius had given Harry a two-way mirror, which he and Harry's father James utilized during their school days. While Harry does use a fragment of the mirror to contact Aberforth later in the series, it would have been more advantageous if he had used it to confirm whether or not Sirius was in danger before acting upon his fears. The books do mention that Harry forgot about the mirror in his haste, but it does seem quite improbable that no one would have thought to use it at any point. How old is McGonagall? This particular plot hole actually branches over into the Fantastic Beasts universe. According to the timelines presented in the books, it was a commonly held belief that Professor McGonagall was born in the year 1935. However, her appearance in a scene set at Hogwarts in 1910, depicted in the crimes of Grindelwald, left everyone a little bit confused. McGonagall's presumed birth year places her in the late 1880s, but her engagement at the age of 18 to a muggle who died in the First Wizarding War seems to challenge this estimation. At present, there is no reasonable explanation for this inconsistency. Sirius and Polyjuice Potion Though Sirius Black was able to clear his name in the eyes of those closest to him, he remained unable to prove his innocence to the wider wizarding world. Consequently, he was confined to Grimald Place, largely unable to join the other wizards in the Order's battle against Voldemort. At times, his frustration led him to break the rules of his confinement, transforming into his dog form to visit Harry and escape the confines of the house. However, Sirius was cautious since the Ministry was aware of his dog form and he needed to avoid being sent back to Azkaban. And while transforming into his dog form was undoubtedly a sensible precaution, there is another method that Sirius could have explored which seems more appropriate. Polyjuice Potion Polyjuice Potion, which allows you to change your physical form, is seemingly not overly complex to create. Even students with minimal training seem to be able to manage it, and has the ability to deceive any other wizard. Quite easily, Sirius could have assumed the physical form of another Order member, traveling around largely unnoticed. Why Sirius would not have explored this option is a mystery to me. Harry and the Thestrals A Thestral is a breed of winged horse with skeletal and reptilian features, resembling a sort of evil Pegasus. These horses, if you could call them that, pull the carriages at Hogwarts, and are only visible to those who have witnessed death. Harry first sees these creatures at the beginning of his fourth year, following the death of Cedric Diggory. However, fans have pointed out that Harry should have seen Thestrals earlier. In the Goblet of Fire, after the Triwizard Tournament ends and Diggory has already died, Harry sees the horseless carriages. Theoretically, he should have been able to see the Thestrals at that time, but they only become visible to him in the next book. J.K. Rowling herself has addressed this discrepancy, explaining that a person must fully internalize death in order to see Thestrals. Everyone has said to me that Harry saw people die before he could see the Thestrals. Just to clear this up once and for all, this was not a mistake. I really thought this one through. Harry did not see his parents die. He was one year old and in a cot at the time. Although you never see that scene, I wrote it and then cut it. He didn't see it. He was too young to appreciate it. When you find out about the Thestrals, you find that you can see them only when you really understand death in a broader sense, when you really know what it means. Someone said that Harry saw Quirrell die, but that is not true. He was unconscious when Quirrell died in Philosopher's Stone. He did not know until he came around that Quirrell had died when Voldemort left his body. Then you have Cedric, 
With Cedric, fair point. Harry had just seen Cedric die when he got back into the carriages to go back to Hogsmeade Station. I thought about that at the end of Goblet, because I've known from the word go what was drawing the carriages. From Chamber of Secrets, in which there are carriages drawn by invisible things, I have known what was there. I decided that it would be an odd thing to do right at the end of the book. Anyone who has suffered a bereavement knows that there is the immediate shock, but that it takes a little while to appreciate fully that you will never see that person again. Until that had happened, I did not think that Harry could see the Thestrals. That means that when he goes back, he saw these spooky things. It set the tone for Phoenix, which is a much darker book. Neville and Dementors Another plot hole related to Harry's memories of his past arises when the Dementors appear on the Hogwarts train. While most of the children feel cold and miserable in their presence, Harry experiences a more intense reaction. He hears someone screaming, collapses, and requires Professor Lupin's assistance to drive the Dementor away. It is explained that Harry is profoundly affected because he has witnessed true horrors in his past, and the screaming he hears is a memory of his mother's death. This explanation is logical, but it raises the question of why Neville, who also experienced a tragic event in childhood, did not have a similar reaction on the train. Neville's parents were tortured into insanity by the Cruciatus Curse when he was just 16 months old, which is almost the same age that Harry was when his parents died. Moreover, Neville even visited his parents at St. Mungo's, witnessing their state and having knowledge of what happened to them. One would assume that this level of horror would be enough to affect Neville in the presence of Dementors as well. The Port Key Timetable During the Quidditch World Cup, Harry and the Weasleys use a port key, an old boot, to reach the event. Across the Wizarding World, numerous port keys are set up, implying specific activation times. However, the port key Voldemort uses to transport Harry in the Triwizard Tournament must have been enchanted to work only within the maze. As Voldemort couldn't possibly know when Harry would reach the cup, it raises the question of how the port key was timed correctly. Some port keys may have wider timing windows, but the World Cup port keys had a small window to prevent muggles from using them. The Triwizard Cup's port key likely had a wider window to cover the contestants' time in the maze. My point is this, the specifics behind port keys and their timings remains a bit of a mystery. Why didn't the Ministry use its Truth Serum? Veritaserum, capable of compelling truth from the drinker, is one of the most powerful potions in the Wizarding World, but for some strange reason, it's heavily underutilized in the story. This potion had the potential to greatly benefit the Ministry of Magic in resolving a multitude of issues more efficiently. For example, following the First Wizarding War, this Truth Serum could have been used during the trials of known Death Eaters. Some escaped imprisonment by claiming to be under the Imperious Curse, while others, like Sirius Black, were unjustly convicted. The use of Veritas Serum could have eliminated any doubt. I won't go in much further, as I've actually already made a much larger breakdown of why Veritas Serum was used so infrequently, but if you're curious, go and check it out. Why didn't Sirius escape Azkaban sooner? In Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry learns that a dangerous murderer, Sirius Black, has escaped from Azkaban prison with the intention of killing him. Although Sirius' motivations become clearer towards the climax of the film, one thing remains unclear- why he chose to remain imprisoned for such a long time. Fans of the movies and books know that Sirius used his animagus form, a large black dog, to escape. He intentionally lost weight, then transformed and squeezed through the bars of the prison. However, this raises the question of why he didn't do it sooner, as transforming into his animal form seems relatively simple. Sirius could have easily lost the weight in a matter of weeks, so why fester in Azkaban for years? One argument for why Sirius would have remained in Azkaban is that he would have had no way to prove his innocence. However, after seeing Pettigrew in the Weasley family's photo in the newspaper, he would have seen this as an opportunity to regain his freedom and prove his innocence, prompting his escape. Why was Cho Chang at the Battle of Hogwarts? In the Goblet of Fire, we're introduced to Cho Chang, a fifth year student who becomes involved with Cedric Diggory and later joins Dumbledore's army. She also develops a romantic relationship with Harry. 
Interestingly, despite graduating from Hogwarts in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, Cho is still present at the school during the Battle of Hogwarts. This raises the question of why she is still there, especially since she is seen wearing a uniform. The answer to this plot hole sort of boils down to what version of Harry Potter you're looking at, book or movie. In the books, Cho returns to Hogwarts after getting a message on the Dumbledore's army coin, subsequently apparating into Hogshead and entering Hogwarts through Ariana's portrait to join the fight. In the movies, on the other hand, Cho Chang is represented as being in the same year as Harry, which is why she would have been present for the battle. 1. The Financial System Wizarding money, does it make any sense? I don't really think so. Now, let me start off by saying that just because Wizardkind is far more independent than Muggles, able to achieve all sorts of things through magic, it doesn't mean that their society can operate without a financial system. Currency certainly exists in the Wizarding world, existing in the form of galleons, sickles, and canuts. There's even an established Wizarding economy, allowing for a medium of exchange with goods, services. So what's the problem here? The problem is that there is seemingly no consistency with regards to what things cost, or where this money actually comes from. In Harry Potter, there are various established bodies, including the Ministry of Magic, Hogwarts, and even a hospital. In a traditional economy, these things are paid for through taxes, etc. What I wonder is, aside from fines, how do these bodies obtain the necessary income to support their basic infrastructure? The next big issue stems from inconsistencies, i.e. the cost of goods. Drinks and sweets cost sickles and canuts, which makes sense, I guess. But then, a Hogwarts textbook can be as much as nine galleons. To a family like the Weasleys, one galleon is a lot, so while they do obviously struggle, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. 3. Multiple Wands No witch or wizard is complete without their wand, and more often than not, the wand is the instrument through which they are able to channel most of their power. They're made by wand makers like Ollivander, and are composed of both a unique wand wood and wand core, additionally varying in length and flexibility. In the series, we see all sorts of witches and wizards channeling magic through their wands, but one part of the story stuck out to me, the time when Harry used multiple wands at once. Harry notably ends up leveraging multiple wands at once in order to produce more power, casting an extra powerful spell against Fenrir Greyback. My issue with this, why does no one else do it? If more wands equals more power, then why isn't everyone using a couple of wands? It doesn't really make sense. 5. Secret Keepers One of the reasons that the Potters died was because of their chosen secret keeper, their good friend Peter Pettigrew. A secret keeper is a witch or wizard designated to hide a secret, secured by the Fidelius charm, which conceals the secret inside of the secret keeper's soul. Initially, Sirius Black was chosen by James and Lily, but feeling that he would be an obvious target for Voldemort, Sirius instead recommended Peter, who we know doesn't do a particularly good job. The secret in question was the location of the Potter Cottage, a secret that was tied to Pettigrew's soul, unable to be forcibly removed. A dwelling protected by the Fidelius charm, in conjunction with a secret keeper, essentially becomes absolutely hidden, keeping the occupants safe. So, the glaringly obvious issue here is that James and Lily could have just been their own secret keeper. They could have hidden themselves away, secure with their own secret, and they would have never been found. But instead, they chose one of their friends, which is nice, but also doesn't make any sense. 7. Unbreakable Vows The Unbreakable Vow is a binding magical contract that connects two parties. The purpose is simple. It is to bind a fellow witch or wizard to a promise. The participants stand opposite each other and clasp each other's right hands, while a third party acts like a sort of mediator or witness and places the tip of their wand onto the hands of the two participants. The mediator acts almost like a minister and will begin to state conditions or responsibilities related to the vow. After stating each condition of the vow, the participant who is told to uphold said responsibilities must agree to them one by one. If you fail to uphold your side of the bargain after this type of vow, you suffer the ultimate consequence, death. This seems like a pretty good way of ensuring that people are on your side. Yet, in the story, we really don't see much of this happening. Snape enters into one with Narcissa, vowing to protect Draco, but neither Voldemort nor Dumbledore seem to be using this type of vow to ensure that their followers, allies, 
are indeed on their side. You'd think that an unbreakable vow would be part of the Death Eater initiation process, but it isn't. There's a lot of deception in the Harry Potter story that could have been cleared up with a simple vow. 8. Portraits Early on in the story, we're introduced to the Hogwarts magical portraits, depicting witches and wizards from all time periods. It is reinforced that the living portraits in the wizarding world are merely imprints of the dead person, capable only of imitating their basic personality traits. They don't have feelings, memories, or any special capabilities, like we may see with the ghost. This is all fine, however, this explanation of portraits is broken when Dumbledore's portrait is able to communicate wisdom to Snape posthumously. The sentient portraits are certainly an area of the story where some clarification is needed. 9. The Elder Wand Ah, the Elder Wand, one of the primary drivers behind the story and the most powerful wand in all of existence. The Elder Wand is responsible for an incredible amount of death in the story, an enigmatic artifact that is only made even more enigmatic to its unusual passing of ownership. In order to truly master the wand, you must become its true master. But this is where things get tricky. The wand purportedly only changes ownership when its master has truly been bested by another, and this is generally implied to be achieved through murder. However, there are various exceptions to this rule, like with Grindelwald stunning Grigorovich, Malfoy disarming Dumbledore, and Harry finally disarming Malfoy. The issue with this whole disarming thing is that the wand is reinforced as this unforgiving, power-hungry object that wants to be matched with the most powerful wizard around. If that's the case, then how can a much weaker wizard like Malfoy become its owner by simply disarming the extremely powerful Dumbledore? The whole wand loyalty thing is a bit of a mess. 10. International Wizarding Community Perhaps the biggest plot hole of all, to me, is that in a wizarding world, emphasis on the world, that means the UK and all of the other places on the planet, Voldemort only seems to be a threat to Britain. Voldemort was an incredibly powerful dark wizard, and if he truly came to power, then he would have been a threat to everyone, not just Britain. So my question is, why didn't other wizarding communities help? Why didn't other European countries help? It just doesn't make sense. Number 1. The whereabouts of Hagrid and Harry during the missing day. In the very beginning of the novel, we see Albus Dumbledore meet Professor Minerva McGonagall on Privet Drive as they await the arrival of Rubius Hagrid, who was entrusted with bringing an infant Harry Potter to his aunt and uncle's home. This scene is described as after dark, as Dumbledore uses his pusher outer to collect all of the orbs of light from the surrounding streetlights to ensure they are not seen by any neighbours. We also know that an entire day has passed since Voldemort murdered Harry's parents and attempted to murder him. We know this because Harry's uncle, Vernon Dursley, describes all the odd things he sees that day on his way to and during work. These odd things are of course the celebrations of the wizarding world in response to Voldemort's defeat. This means that an entire day has passed since the previous evening, when Hagrid took Harry from the scene of the crime to the pair's arrival at number 4 Privet Drive, leaving the very obvious question of, where the hell were they for 24 hours? Now, we know that Hagrid borrowed Sirius Black's flying motorbike, but it clearly wouldn't have taken a whole day to travel by magic flying motorbike, would it? And we know he flew the bike, at least part of the way, because when he arrives his arrival is from the air. So, with the math just not adding up on this one, it's definitely a plot hole in my opinion. 2. Baby Harry being left outside the Dursleys Are we really meant to believe that the three magical beings, Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Hagrid, who claim to deeply care for the recently orphaned one-year-old Harry, just left him outside of the Dursleys' doors in the middle of a chilly October night? Think about it. There's no mention of any sort of magical spell cast to protect Tiny Harry from the elements. Nor do the three wizards seem all that bothered by the thought that they're just dumping a baby on the Dursley's doorstep, with the assumption that, at some point, the next day, either Vernon or Petunia will find him. If not a plot hole, it is, at the very least, incredibly weird. Number 3. Mrs. Weasley not remembering Platform 9 and 3 quarters this plot hole is more like a giant oversight, in my opinion. Readers of the Philosopher's Stone may recall that the only reason Harry notices the Weasley family while at King's Cross Station is that he overhears Ron's dear mum, Molly, 
trying to remember the platform number of the Hogwarts Express. Out loud, I might add. I personally find it incredibly hard to believe that after previously bringing five Weasley children to Platform 9 and 3 quarters throughout the course of their educations at Hogwarts, she would not have this number absolutely cemented in her mind. Not to mention that the platform number never changes. Every subsequent year that Harry catches the train to school, the platform is always 9 and 3 quarters. Number 4. The Concept of Poor Witches and Wizards The concept that members of the wizarding community could be poor is a rather confusing one if you ask me. Of course, we're clearly introduced to this idea in the Philosopher's Stone, with the explanation of the Weasley's reputation and description of Ron's shabby clothing and hand-me-down wand. But, in a world in which magic can conjure food and transform one inanimate object into another, couldn't any witch or wizard who wanted to be better off simply create more wealth for themselves? Seems to me this is quite a substantial plot hole. Number 5. How the Dursleys Returned from the Island As you will likely remember, when Harry started receiving his admission letters to Hogwarts, Vernon Dursley brought the entire family to a rickety old hut on an isolated island in a desperate attempt to hide from the magical letters. This didn't work, of course, as Hagrid, who was tasked to ensure Harry did indeed receive his acceptance letter, easily tracked them down and delivered Harry's mail to him in person. Now the plot hole to this portion of the story is that the island was so isolated that the only way the Dursleys and Harry were able to get there was to travel by a small rowboat. As Hagrid was granted permission from Dumbledore to use magic until he found Harry, he himself flew over to the island, presumably using his umbrella which he illegally constructed using his broken wand, but I digress. Anyway, upon finding Harry, Hagrid was no longer authorized to use magic, so the two of them departed the island using the one and only rowboat. So how on earth did the Dursleys get back to the mainland? Number 6. Traps for the Stone were solved by untrained children Now, near the very beginning of the novel, the Philosopher's Stone is transferred from Gringotts to Hogwarts by Hagrid, on the orders of Dumbledore. Presumably, this is done to keep the stone in the safest place possible. However, why Dumbledore believed that a castle filled with a bunch of curious students would be a more secure location than a magical bank vault that trapped any trespassers for eternity, with goblins only checking the vault every decade or two, is, well, beyond me. In any case, we later learn that the stone is placed behind traps and enchantments created by all the combined magical prowess that the professors of Hogwarts had to offer. Which brings me to a plot hole within this plot hole. Why would the traps protecting this incredibly valuable magical artifact be solvable? Each trap is actually more of a puzzle, but once again, I digress. Anyway, not only were each of the traps protecting the stone solvable, they were all solvable by a group of first year students. Not the best and brightest of wizard kind, but three 11 year olds, two of whom didn't even know magic existed less than a year prior. Number 7. Hogwarts doesn't offer muggle core subjects. Now, it's arguable that perhaps witches and wizards don't have much use for maths or muggle history, but the fact that there's no language classes is a bit baffling to me. Firstly, you'd think there'd be even a minor focus on being able to properly write and communicate, but also, I would have thought that the language of other countries, not to mention other magical species, would have been offered as at least electives. 8. The required school supplies are archaic Okay, this has never made any sense to me. I mean, I get that magic is often associated with medieval times and whatnot, but why on earth would one of the most prominent wizarding schools in the world have not evolved with modern times in terms of school supplies? I mean, perhaps with some witches and wizards living over a century, a few of these items may simply have not been phased out yet, as in, I could see some of the older professors not updating the list of what's required for their classes. But you'd think that the teenagers who make up the majority of Hogwarts population would have, at the very least, requested the option of getting a pack of pens and a notebook instead of quills and parchment. 9. The Hypocritical Punishment for Breaking Curfew As you may recall, partway through the Philosopher's Stone, Harry is caught breaking curfew, a curfew which has been instated to protect the students of Hogwarts. 
And yet, and yet, the very punishment bestowed upon the children for being out after dark is to send them out into the dark. And not just any dark, but dark within the forbidden forest, full of creepy and dangerous magical creatures. So bizarre. 10. Dumbledore Destroying the Stone in the End So when Dumbledore explains to Harry at the very end of the novel that the stone has simply been destroyed, a very obvious question crept, wait, no, leapt into my mind. Why go to all that trouble to protect the stone, transfer it from Gringotts to Hogwarts, only to end up destroying it? If getting rid of it was the safest option, shouldn't that have been the first option? I mean, I'm all for trying something out to see if it works, but this seems like an incredibly risky thing to have done. I suppose there is the argument that Albus suspected that Voldemort was gaining strength and thought this might be a good way to gas him out or something. Or perhaps he simply wanted to see what Harry Potter was capable of, since he admits in the final installment of the series that he's been mentoring him in order to meet his death against Voldemort. Or maybe this is just another plot hole with no rational explanation. 8. You don't need glasses with Polyjuice Polyjuice Potion is one of those classic concoctions that seems to open itself up to a ton of tiny plot holes. And when we look at how the magical potion was used in the Chamber of Secrets, this trend continues. At one point, Harry and Ron chug down a draft of Polyjuice and transform into copies of Crab and Goyle, but there's a small inconsistency with the whole scene. When Harry transforms, he forgets to take off his glasses which doesn't really make sense. Since it's been long established that eyesight is one of the traits that transforms after you consume Polyjuice Potion, then Harry should have immediately noticed that he didn't need his glasses. Unless Malfoy's lackeys also suffered from poor vision and simply never wore glasses because they were too vain and didn't want to be teased by Draco. 7. Harry Lied to Hedwig Long before Harry had any inkling that a basilisk lived in the dungeons of Hogwarts, he was busy, suffering through the summer months amongst the muggles. At one point while sitting alongside Hedwig, the owl seemed to make a gesture towards Harry, almost as if she was asking to be released from her cage so she could enjoy a quick flight. But Harry didn't open the small door to her cage. Instead, he simply stated to Hedwig that he wasn't allowed to use magic outside of Hogwarts. But if you think about it, why would Harry need to use magic in order to open her cage? All he needed was a tiny key, which was clearly visible. Either Harry lied because he didn't want to deal with taking his pet for a flight, or something else was afoot. 6. How did Nearly Headless Nick recover? Whenever a poor, helpless victim stared into the eyes of a basilisk, they were sure to die. That's what made the massive serpent such a terrifying beast. But during Harry's second year at Hogwarts, the students and creatures who were struck by the basilisk's gaze were lucky to avoid it directly. They simply saw the dark snake's eyes through a reflection, which spared them from death. Instead, these victims were petrified and stuck in a suspended state. But besides these fortunate living beings, there was one undead spirit who met the basilisk's eyes, straight on, nearly headless Nick. Since Nick was already dead, the basilisk's gaze wasn't able to push him further away from the living world. Instead, it seemed to petrify him as well. Now, those among the living who saw the basilisk's gaze had a long, difficult road to recovery. They managed to be cured through the meticulous witchcraft of Madame Pomfrey in Hogwarts Hospital Wing. But those elixirs and remedies must not have had much of an effect on ghosts. So how did Nick manage to recover from the attack of one of the deadliest dark creatures in the entire wizarding world? I'm surprised it had any effect on him in the first place. 5. Why did Dobby want to save Harry? Dobby's courage and the stoutness of house elves were among the most endearing parts of the Chamber of Secrets. But have you ever wondered why Dobby went through such great lengths to save Harry? Because if you think of all the ways that a house elf might expend their energy, helping a random second year Hogwarts student isn't one of the best ways. Although Dobby probably heard of Harry Potter when he was eavesdropping on Draco's conversations with his mother, what would have made Dobby so obsessed with the boy who lived? And how could Dobby have known that Harry was going to be the target of the creature within the Chamber of Secrets? Even though the Malfoys thought very little of house elves, and Dobby in particular, 
Lucius was a somewhat discreet wizard. He's not the type to openly discuss a secret plot, like the one that saw him surreptitiously slip Tom Riddle's diary into Ginny Weasley's things. How Dobby knew about the chamber and why Dobby decided to save Harry are two issues that don't clearly have answers. Of course, there are a few different explanations that might partially fill this plot hole. Dobby obviously knew that the Death Eaters and their leader were even worse than normal wizards when it came to the care of house elves. And if Lord Voldemort successfully overthrew the Ministry of Magic, then Dobby's life would be far worse off. Perhaps that was enough for Dobby to become obsessed with Harry and try to save him. 4. Gilderoy Lockhart doesn't make any sense. As much as I love Gilderoy Lockhart, his very existence seems to undermine the intelligence of the rest of the wizarding community. Harry, Ron, and Hermione pretty easily determined that Lockhart was a fraudster. And I know, I know, these three Hogwarts students aren't exactly run of the mill wizards and witches. Together, they've achieved greater heights than many adult magic users in the wizarding world. But still, it's strange that these children exposed Lockhart quicker than anyone else. And to make no mistake, by the start of Harry Potter's second school year, Gilderoy Lockhart's act as the most courageous wizard in Britain was still untarnished. After all, besides Albus Dumbledore, few wizards even suspected that Lockhart's achievements weren't his own. And even Dumbledore's perspective on the matter wasn't fully explained until JK Rowling penned a separate piece explaining why the wise old wizard would have wasted his students' time with such a worthless professor. Sure, some like Severus Snape had their doubts, but it's pretty strange that the rest of the Hogwarts faculty didn't see right through Lockhart and immediately request his dismissal from the school. Perhaps they kept their mouths shut out of respect for Dumbledore. 3. Basilisk, Venom, and Harry's Horcrux In the depths of Hogwarts, while fending off the Basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets, Harry struggled to keep the serpent at bay, and in the end, when he struck a killing blow on the snake, Harry himself received a mortal wound. One of the dark creature's fangs pierced Harry's skin and injected him with the infamous Basilisk Venom. From that moment, only a few minutes would pass until Harry met certain death. Of course, Vaux, the phoenix who fought by Albus Dumbledore's side time and time again, intervened. His tears healed Harry's wounds before the venom brought him to the other side, but that opens up a few questions. As we know, Basilisk Venom is one of the only materials capable of destroying Horcruxes. In fact, when Harry, Ron, and Hermione scour the British countryside during the events of the Deathly Hallows, it's almost exclusively Basilisk Venom and the Venom powers passed on to Gryffindor's sword that they use. So, shouldn't the Venom have killed the bit of Voldemort's soul that had latched onto Harry? Eventually, JK Rowling was forced to answer this question, but that answer only seemed to justify the Horcrux's continued existence on a technicality. If you're interested in a full explanation, I've done a video on it. 2. Broken Wands Should Work, But Ron's Doesn't Throughout the Chamber of Secrets, Ron Weasley stoically faces life at Hogwarts with a broken wand. Unfortunately for the youngest Weasley boy, his wand had been all but destroyed during his flight to Hogwarts at the beginning of the semester. Now, Ron could have easily asked his parents for a new one from Ollivander's shop, but that would have run the risk of a scolding, and Ron was already too traumatized to receive yet another howler in the Great Hall in front of all of his peers. So Ron simply suffered, enduring failure after failure as he struggled to fulfill the most basic spells. But Ron's experience with a broken wand doesn't really compare well to others. Hagrid famously used a broken wand after it was first shattered when he was expelled from Hogwarts decades prior. Yes, it was encased in an umbrella, but it was still broken. Even though the half-giant suffered a few hiccups during spell casting, he was still able to achieve his desired results, more or less. So that makes you wonder, why was Ron's wand so bad? Is this just a simple pothole, or was Ron's wand constructed of inferior equipment? Or more likely, was Ron's own inexperience the reason why his broken wand performed so poorly? If he had been a more experienced wizard, would he have cast better spells despite the sad state of his wand? 1. The Basilisk's Size By the end of the Chamber of Secrets, the voices that Harry Potter hears within the walls were explained. It was a basilisk and its voice didn't come from the walls, but from the nooks, crannies, and pipes that laid beyond it. 
But if you know anything about indoor plumbing, then you'd realize that pipes are really, really small. Oftentimes, even commercial grade plumbing is only a few inches in diameter. Relatively normal, non-exotic snakes have been known to get stuck in commercial plumbing, and it's required expensive plumbers to yank them out. So how could a basilisk, which was larger than many of the wingless dragons that populated Hungary, fit in such tiny spaces? Well, the simple answer is that it couldn't. Even underground pipes might not have fit the massive beast. So how was it able to navigate around Hogwarts and pop up where students, and cats, least expected it? As a fantastical realm, even the sewage system within Hogwarts was gigantic, and dare I say, majestic. There were certainly places that a basilisk could have fit, but the bathroom pipes don't seem like one. Why didn't they clean up the Chamber of Secrets? The basilisk is one of the most dangerous creatures in the entire wizarding world. When compared to other beasts, like acromantulas and giants, the basilisk was actually far worse. To show you just how dangerous they are, an average wizard would have a better chance surviving a fight with a Hungarian horntail than the serpent that Herpo the Fowl first created. And it makes sense if you think about it. Just one glance from a basilisk was enough to stop your heart. That meant you had to fight with your eyes closed. How many creatures would be able to trade blows with a basilisk if they were robbed of their sight? And the giant serpent's fangs excreted the most vile, poisonous venom that any magical creature could produce. So you have to wonder, why didn't Albus Dumbledore clean up the remains of the basilisk after Harry Potter slayed it at the end of the Chamber of Secrets? Its rotting corpse was more than an unsightly display. Every inch of the basilisk was a precious ingredient that any dark wizard or angsty student would love to retrieve for their potions. Can you imagine all of the dark hexes and curses that a single drop of basilisk venom could create? And let's not forget that the Chamber of Secrets was created by Salazar Slytherin in the first place. Slytherin created the chamber and left the monstrous basilisk behind, in protest of his other co-founders, who had refused to follow his lead in banning Muggleborn students from attending Hogwarts. Why didn't Dumbledore and the rest of Hogwarts staff march into the chamber and clear it of all dark relics? Moaning Myrtle's Parents When discussing the tragic death of Moaning Myrtle, Tom Riddle bemoaned the fate of her parents. Her poor mother and father, who had never considered the risk their daughter faced at Hogwarts, would be forced to visit Hogwarts and attend their own daughter's funeral. But there was a problem with that. Hogwarts famously never allowed muggles to step foot on its campus, which meant Myrtle's parents shouldn't have made the trip. So how did they? Of all the theories on the internet, the most compelling one was pretty simple. Maybe the headmaster of the time made an exception. Of course, Tom Riddle attended Hogwarts decades before Albus Dumbledore was ever promoted, so the headmaster of the time must have been Armando Dippet. As one of the oldest wizards to hold the title, and one particularly fond of rules, it's unlikely that Dippet would have allowed Myrtle's parents in. How did the basilisk survive? And while we're talking about the basilisk, have you ever wondered what it ate? Since it was supposedly locked within the chamber throughout its 1,000 year lifespan, what could it have eaten in order to survive so long? When thinking about this question, you might be tempted to chime in with a few obvious answers. Typically, man-made structures quickly become home to pests like mice and rats, but would that have been enough to sustain the basilisk? Even during Harry Potter's second year, there were no recorded deaths, and no students were eaten, and students certainly seem like the most likely source of sustenance in the otherwise barren castle. An easy way to fill this plot hole is to assume that a large, magical, rodent-like creature also resided in the Chamber of Secrets. With so much water and waste flowing around, it wouldn't be unthinkable for nests of giant rats to call the chamber their second home. But of course, Herpa the Fowl, the terrifying dark wizard who first successfully bred basilisks, never told us how often and how much they needed to eat. For some more developed theories addressing this, check out my longer video on the subject. The Basilisk's Hissing We all know that only parcel tongues can communicate with serpents. That fact remains true of basilisks, too. 
which is why Harry Potter was the only one who could hear the faint whispers in the walls during his second year at Hogwarts. But throughout Harry's time at Hogwarts, Ron and Hermione had the chance to observe him speaking Parseltongue more than a few times, and during those interactions, they very clearly could not only hear Potter's bizarre speech, but the snake's own hissing as well. But throughout their second year, when Hermione and Ron were close to Harry, they seemed to be oblivious to the very large, hissing snake that was somewhere nearby, climbing up the ancient, leaky pipes behind the brick walls. You might be tempted to quickly sweep this plot hole under the rug by pointing to Harry's telepathic-like connection to snakes, or you might claim that snake hissing seems to be amplified for parcel tongues. All that might be true, but it's certainly inconsistent for Ron and Hermione to hear the hissing at some times, and at others, hear nothing at all. Some simple math. When we look at plot holes within the Chamber of Secrets, it's easy to try and brush them under the rug and find a reason for their existence. And I suppose that's all part of the fun. For example, when we wonder why the Basilisk didn't more aggressively target Harry earlier, we can find any number of reasons, namely Voldemort's own vanity. But when it comes to this particular plot hole, I think that the truth is, the numbers just don't add up. Within the Chamber of Secrets, Lord Voldemort made a small mistake when trying to belittle James and Lily Potter's sacrifice. The Dark Wizard claimed that the parents' deaths ensured a measly 12 years of peace and quiet for their son, but if Voldemort had studied a bit harder in math class, he would have realized that it had only been about 11 years since the fateful night he had first tried to kill the Potter boy. Plot hole or mistake, whatever the case may be, this fun little inconsistency is one that opens up a treasure trove of topics for debate. 6. Time Turner Rules Now, when we talk about plot holes in the Prisoner of Azkaban, the Time Turners present more than their fair share. For starters, it doesn't really make too much sense to allow a 13-year-old girl access to time travel. Even if Hermione was the most trustworthy student at Hogwarts, why would Professor Minerva McGonagall entrust her with such a dangerous device? Not only could she have destroyed the future, she could have harmed herself. Time travel was tricky, as Lord Voldemort and Harry Potter's own children demonstrated decades later. Which brings me to my next point. Why weren't time turners used more often? In later years, J.K. Rowling carefully explained just how impractical a time turner would be for preventing loved ones from dying. After all, with time travel established in the Wizarding World, it wouldn't really make sense for the likes of Dumbledore to not use it, especially when traveling back in time would have saved the world from so many of Voldemort's atrocities. During the events of the Prisoner of Azkaban, every time turner in Britain had been charmed with a special spell, so that its users could only ever stay in the past for, at most, five hours. But by the time Albus Severus Potter enrolled at Hogwarts, the rules for time turners changed. A new batch of devices had been created, and one of them provided unbridled travel to and from the past. When we try to wonder why the Ministry of Magic and the staff at Hogwarts never used time travel more frequently, the only obvious answer we can find is that it was simply too dangerous. But that raises another question. Number 5. Why didn't Voldemort try to get a time turner? Why didn't Voldemort ever try to get his hands on a time turner? Even if he only used the devices that the Ministry of Magic controlled, which didn't allow free travel through time, the Dark Wizard could have accomplished far more than he did during the seven years Harry attended Hogwarts. And when you think about it, you have to wonder why Voldemort never tried his hand at creating a true time turner, like the one that Draco Malfoy used when he saved his son Scorpius and Albus Potter from the past. Voldemort was the most powerful dark wizard in recorded history. He was, perhaps, even greater than Herper the Fowl, the infamous sorcerer who first bred basilisks. And when he tore his soul into seven parts and created his horcruxes, Voldemort demonstrated that there was no aspect of magic too taboo for him to utilize. So, if a teenage girl like Hermione was able to achieve so much with the Time Turner, why didn't Lord Voldemort ever employ them? If his Death Eaters had only one of the Time Turners in their possession, the night their master first died while failing to kill an infant Harry Potter, they could have quickly brought him back to life. 4. 
Harry used magic outside of school. Several times throughout the film series, Harry Potter flinched at the idea of using magic outside of Hogwarts. He was underage, and performing magic was always a risky affair. The ministry would quickly track him down, and Harry was starting to get the feeling that Cornelius Fudge's subordinates weren't too happy with his troublemaking ways. Even when Harry was older, there were times when he hesitated to use magic outside of the school. But during the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry used a small charm, Lumos Maxima, while practicing sorcery in his bedroom. Even though it was a relatively small display of magic, and nothing that would risk exposing himself to muggles, the Ministry could have punished him, and Harry should have been well aware of that. But he didn't seem to care, as he practiced the incantation under the safety of his bedsheets. 3. Mrs. Norris's Yellow Eyes Argus Filch was the resident caretaker for Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. He was infamous for more than a few bizarre personality traits, but students knew him best for the strange relationship he shared with his pet, Mrs. Norris. The brown cat was more than just a critter that Filch fed and bathed. Although Dumbledore treated Argus with respect, there was no debate surrounding the sad fate that Filch suffered. He was a squib, the offspring of magical parents who bore no magical ability of his own. And due to that, he was never able to climb through the rigid hierarchy of wizarding society. Instead of learning the ins and outs of potion making and launching a successful career as a hair loss elixirist or a magizoologist, Filch only served the magical class. And as a caretaker, that meant cleaning up the messes that all the young wizards and witches around Hogwarts made. And Mrs. Norris, his only companion, was always faithfully at his side. But if you pay close attention to Mrs. Norris and the Prisoner of Azkaban, you'll notice something. Her eye color changes. Now, this feline's eyes would change in later films as well, but in the Prisoner of Azkaban, if you focus, you can see that they flash from yellow in one scene back to red. 1. How did Sirius afford presents? Sirius Black was a convicted murderer. By the time he escaped Azkaban, every wizard and witch knew exactly what Black went to jail for, and the posters that adhered to every wall and building would help remind them, just in case they forgot. So, with so much heat on his trail, how did Sirius manage to buy Harry Potter a brand new broomstick? The Ministry of Magic and their auras would have staked out every known Black family holding. There'd be no secret castle or Diagon Alley apartment where Black can hide, retrieve a few gold galleons, and continue on his journey to redemption. So, how exactly did he get money? And how exactly did he buy Harry's gifts? And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed the compilation, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live.